everybody, welcome back. Today we're looking at Chapter 7, Section 1, A Loose Confederation. Now, like I said in the introduction lesson, uh, Chapter 7 is all about the time period just after the American Revolution. So we need to try and take uh, these 13 colonies that had broken away from England and try and form a new nation out of these colonies. So the first attempt is what we will be talking about today. And in our central question, it gives us a clue to our what the discussion will be about, and that is, what were the strengths and weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation? So I want you to keep that back in, in the back of your mind that this is a clue that today we'll be talking about the Articles of Confederation, but as you can see in the central question, it had its strengths, but it also had its weaknesses. So be looking for that as we go through today's discussion. So our key terms for today, Constitution, Bill of Rights, Articles of Confederation, which, like I said, we will be talking about most of, Seed, and this is C-E-D-E, -E, which means to give up, not seed like something you plant in the ground and watch it grow. This is to give up. Currency, the Land Ordinance of 1785, also known as the Northwest Ordinance, and Shays' Rebellion. So these are just a few of the things that we will be discussing today. Do these two gentlemen look familiar? Do these two gentlemen look familiar? Well, they should, to most of you, because in our very recent past, we were able to witness a very historic election. And pictured here are uh, President Barack Obama and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney. Now, why am I showing you these two pictures? Well, I want you to think about this for a second. Each man had his own plan about how the United States should be run and how to improve life for the American public, for American citizens. So each man had his own ideas of how the country so since each man so since each man wanted to be a pre wanted to be president, um, this is what would happen, right? Now what's wrong with this picture? Exactly. The president is not a king. He does not just make a decision and then immediately that becomes the law of the land. There's a whole process to changing laws and policies, but that process is carried out by a, a whole group of people that we, the public, have elected. But what if there was no government? Who would make the decisions? Would every state or even town make its own decisions for how things should be run? There would be, there didn't, there wouldn't necessarily have to be anything from town to town that was the same. In one town, you might be able to chew gum all day, every day, but in another town, they could make gum chewing illegal. Money wouldn't work because money in one town would be would would have one value, and then it could have a completely different value in a different town, or they wouldn't accept that money at all, and so on and so on. So these, so these are some of the problems that are facing, facing America right after the Revolutionary War. Uh, many of the citizens were afraid that they had just left one tyrant, King George III, but that a new government might be set up in its place that could be just as bad. So as we go through today's lesson, I want you to try and put yourself in the shoes of those early Americans. They, they had just uh, broken away from British rule, um, and you just fought a war to gain your independence, uh, but now that you need to set up a government for yourself. So here's some things that you might, might be thinking about. Um, what are some of the things you would want the government to do for you? Um, and along with that, what are some of the reasons that you fought the war in the first place? Um, and how do you think those values will affect your decisions in regards to this new government? Remember, you just broke away from one tyrant, so there's a good chance you don't want to just go right back under another, another tyrant. So our first video uh, today, the title is 
Anxieties of Independence, and I feel the title is very fitting for kind of setting the stage for our discussion today. So we're going to watch this video and pick right back up uh, in just a The military conflict may be over, but the political struggle within America still simmers. Even after the revolution had succeeded, the long-term prospects for the American colonies as a union for the United States were very much up in the air. All through the 1780s and 90s, you can see lots of anxiety by Americans themselves about the longevity of this experiment, uh, about the precariousness of, of this union because of internal difficulties and also because of threats from abroad. Arguments over remembering the revolution began to surface. Jefferson and Adams and Franklin and Washington and all the others had different recollections. Not that they disagreed on everything by far, but they had different takes on the revolution. And sometimes got quite angry with each other about what was remembered or what ought to be remembered. We look back now and we know how the story came out and everything seemed seems to us if not preordained, very stable, very predictable. The leaders of the country and many elements in the country were quite sensibly worried. It was one thing to break away from England, uh, quite another matter to keep these separate colonies working together. The state's right constitutions. Now, pictured here is the Massachusetts State Constitution of 1780. Now, most of the states wrote their own constitutions, and they did so for two reasons. But what is a constitution? As we see here in the key terms, a constitution is really just a document that sets out the laws, principles, organization, and processes of a government. So each state wrote its own document to set out the laws and show how that state would be governed. Now, why did they write their own constitutions? Well, most of the states wrote these constitutions for two reasons. Reason number one, a written constitution spells out the rights of all citizens. So if I flip that over, uh, by spelling out the rights of the citizens, the government is less likely to be able to deny those rights to citizens. And some states went as far as to include a Bill of Rights into their constitutions which would guarantee these rights to the people. So the first reason, number one, is a written constitution spells out the rights of all citizens. Um, so that's one reason. Reason number two, writing out a constitution limits the power of the government by stating exactly what the government's powers are. Um, and many of the states structured their new state governments uh, in a similar way to their colonial governments. So uh, power would be divided between an executive and a legislature, and in the state's case, an executive would be a governor. And the, the legislature would be elected by the voters to pass the laws. Now. Uh, by limiting the power of the government, citizens would be safer from one person or group becoming too powerful or too tyrannical. Um, and under a lot of these state governments, more people could vote, but for the most part, um, conditions still had to be met. Uh, over 21, own property, a lot of the same conditions that were under the colonial governments, the colonial legislatures in order to be able to vote. Like you have to be um, white male property owner over 25. Remember that from chapter four. Uh, a lot of those things still were in place. Um, more, they were, the rights were extended to more citizens, but there were still conditions that had to be, had to be met in order to vote. Even to this day, there are still conditions uh, in order to be able to vote, you need to be an American citizen, and you have to be 18 years or older. Um, it's not a lot of things that you have to meet, but there are still some conditions in order to be able to take part in the voting process. And our next video is actually going to go into this a little bit more about the constructing of these state constitutions.
At the same time Americans were struggling to win their independence on the battlefield, they were also struggling to create new institutions of government for themselves. They found it much easier to shape their state institutions than to decide on a form for their national government. Not every new state did it the same way. Some states would have constitutional conventions, some would have their assemblies uh, contribute to writing new state constitutions, because that was the first process. And that actually began even before the war was over. These new states, having thrown off the uh, royal authority, had to constitute new authority within each colony, new state. For example, John Adams wrote the state constitution for Massachusetts in 1779, it had to be submitted to be ratified by every town in Massachusetts, which was a, a couple of hundred. And then when the ratification came back with great revisions and changes, he rewrote it in 1780, and that had to be resubmitted. And the extraordinary thing about this is that we have the responses of the towns of Massachusetts. There are over 200 of them. We have what they wrote back. And you have the picture at least in Massachusetts, but it's true in many other places as well, of groups of people, farmers, uh, people in taverns, preachers, whatever, getting together and writing back their considerations on the clauses of the Constitution. So you get, it, it is really quite remarkable, you get a bunch of farmers in Amesbury, Massachusetts, which maybe had 300 people in it, who write back very severe comments on the clause relating to the Supreme Court. I mean, I don't think they knew anything about the Supreme Court, but they felt the obligation to comment on this uh, public document that was being imposed on them. In the cauldron of the revolutionary movement, they began to imagine uh, what we now think of as the rights of men, which would ultimately become the rights of women too. Natural rights, rights that, as they put it, had been given to human beings at the creation and therefore could not be taken away and were inalienable. And uh, no one had talked in this language in a serious way to start a political movement before. And you might have thought that they would just leave it at that. Uh, an argument that's good at a particular moment does not have to stick around. Uh, but by embedding this in the Declaration of Independence, that generation made it a piece of the cornerstone of the language of American democracy in a way that had not been done uh, before. That whole process of constitution writing and thinking about it and envisioning the world as they wanted it to be was a very exciting one, but also one fraught with, with many unknowns and difficulties and disagreements of the kind that you would expect. So that was exciting and a highly fertile and interesting period in political thinking and in political participation. Which brings us to the meat of what we'll be talking about today, the Articles of Confederation. Now, these state governments were very important, and they still are, but for the new nation to survive, there needed to be some sort of national government, something that would govern the country as a whole. And the difficulty came in trying to write a constitution that everyone would like and one that would please all of the citizens. So remember, remember when I, I told you at the very beginning of this to, to keep in the back of your mind? Remember, thanks to England, the American people were very skeptical of very strong central governments. Um, they had just come away from British rule where all of the power was centralized in England, but the, the British Empire spanned the entire globe. Um, England had built this vast, vast empire with itself as the ruling center. And the last thing that the Americans wanted was to be a part of another empire. So after a lot of debating in the Con Constitutional Congress, uh, in 1777, the Articles of Confederation were approved. And the Articles of Confederation, I want you to remember, pay close attention, they created a very loose alliance between the 13 states. That's, a, that's key. It's that, keep that in mind, the Articles of Confederation created a very loose alliance between the 13 states. So let's look at some of those, uh, the, the very limited powers of the Articles of Confederation. So this graphic kind of gives us an idea of the powers 
granted by the Ar Articles of Confederation. They could raise armies, declare war, sign treaties, but it also withheld a lot of powers. So under the Articles of Confederation, this is the way the government was set up. Each state had one vote in Congress, and the powers of Congress were limited to they, Congress could declare war, they could appoint military officers, they could coin money, and they were responsible for foreign affairs, uh, writing and signing treaties. And that was it. Congress could, Congress could coin money. That's a good thing. And that was it. Congress could coin money, but like we see here, they had no power to collect taxes. They could declare war, and they could appoint military officers, but they couldn't actually create a military. So it's kind of hard to fight in a war when all you have are officers and no military. Um, Congress could pass laws, but it needed approval of nine of the 13 states in order to approve those laws. So every law needed to be approved by nine of the 13 state legislatures in order for the law to go effect. So Congress could create the law, but then it had to be sent out to all of the state legislatures and approved by nine out of the 13. Also, there was no executive branch or judicial branch, so no president and no courts. So that was it. Um, not a lot of not a lot going on with the Articles of Confederation as far as giving power to the central government, which to the colonists, they were like, this is perfect. We don't want a very strong central government. Why would they not want a strong, strong central government? Well, one of the things, uh, smaller states were afraid that larger states would use the central government to become way, way too powerful. Even before the Articles of Confederation went into effect, there was a dispute between Maryland and some other states about land claims. Uh, Maryland in particular refused to ratify the Articles of Confederation unless Virginia and some of the other states ceded, that's where the word is being used, or gave up lands that they had claimed west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, because they were afraid that these large states would would become even larger and become even more powerful. And so Maryland voices its opinion and says, we're not going to sign, we're not going to ratify this unless something happens out west. And then other small states started popping up uh, saying, yeah, we agree with Maryland. Um, to, they, were, they were afraid, so they want to let everybody know, like, we don't like this. But ultimately... The Articles of Confederation were ratified in 1781, and our next video is going to talk a little bit more about the Articles of Confederation in general. The Confederation, under the Articles adopted in 1781, is confronted with even more daunting challenges. There were unsettled issues. The British did not evacuate the Northwest forts as they were supposed to. The fisheries question was not completely resolved, and the British did not give compensation for slaves that they had taken with them and freed in the South. So there were a number of lingering issues. During the 1780s, there were so many problems in the United States, economic problems, social conflict within the country, uh, problems with their British and their Spanish neighbors, problems with the Indians, that it became manifest that the Articles of Confederation were too weak, and they, they weren't the right balance point. In 1784, Congress sends John Adams to London to resolve these differences. But Adams makes no headway with the English. The young nation experiences similar difficulties with Spain. There are all kinds of shady characters, fomenting of secessionist movements, especially in the southwest, what was then the southwest, what we would now call Louisiana and Mississippi. Spain controlled the Mississippi, closed the port of New Orleans. This was in a country that is trying to get back on its feet economically and restore trade. This was a major blow. 
the, the United States, especially under the Articles of Confederation, was far from overawing international powers uh, with their uh, might, and they weren't getting any respect from these uh, foreign countries. And the question becomes, then, what powers does uh, Congress have? They aren't given the power to regulate trade. They certainly don't have the power to tax. Uh, and uh, it's therefore a very weak government. And why is it that weak a government? And I think it's uh, really because sovereignty resides with the states, not with the United States. And that's the paradox of the Articles Confederation. They were good enough for the war, but they were impossible uh, during time of peace. And simply the reason for that is uh, the United States didn't, in 1783, become truly independent of the world. There were lots of outstanding problems that had to be negotiated, namely commercial treaties with the European powers, a stable peace, American prosperity depended on European trade. And one of the things that Americans desperately wanted was a favorable commercial treaty with the British, which was not forthcoming. And nobody took the Americans seriously after the Peace of Paris because they had no leverage in the international balance of power. So let's look at some of the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Um, pictured here, uh, I had just mentioned about um, Maryland wanting other states to cede the area that they gave up. Well, this is uh, in particular, you can see that this area just west of Pennsylvania had been claimed by New York and Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and the whole, almost the entirety of the Northwest Territory was, uh, had been claimed by Virginia. So this is a little bit better idea of what we were talking about. Now, even though the United States had won the Revolutionary War, many really seriously doubted that the country could survive. Um, conflicts between the states arose, but under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government really couldn't do anything to solve those disputes, like this one. And another, and another problem, which seems to always be a problem, is money. After the revolution, the United States owed millions of dollars to individuals and to foreign nations with no, pay to, no way to repay those debts. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound a little bit like what happened after the French and Indian War? Yes, it does. But this time... Congress had no power to tax, so what it had to do was it had to ask the states for money, but for the most part, the states refused. And think about this like logically. If you were one of those states and the federal government asked you for money, would you give it? Let's look at it this way. Uh, say you have no rules in your house everyone's able to do whatever they want in the house. So your mom comes to you and asks you to clean your room, but there are no consequences if you don't clean your room. Uh, cleaning your room is totally up to you. Now, maybe you like having a clean room, so you do what your mom asked, but if you don't mind living in a messy room and living in utter filth, you might not be so willing to listen to your mom's request. So, in a very watered-down sense, that's kind of what's going on with the tax situation here. Congress could only ask states for money, but it had no way of forcing them to pay up. And some states did give money because they, they wanted to, but most states could not care less and refused to help out. Now, it wasn't just the collecting of taxes that was a problem, it was the, the actual money itself became a problem. The money that Congress printed, remember that was one of their powers, they had the power to print currency, uh, the money they printed was became nearly worthless because each state was printing its own money. Um, a North Carolina dollar was not worth the same as a Maryland dollar or as a Massachusetts dollar. So it's it's like going to Europe before the euro was was like widely accepted as a as as a main currency. Um, each country, each country still has its own currency, and uh, without the euro, there really isn't a standard. So at this point in our history, 
the states were more like individual countries than a united group of states or the United States. And what would happen if a state just up and refused to accept money from an, a different state? Uh, so this was seriously affecting trade at this time. So taxing was a problem and the actual money itself was also a problem. So remember how I said that a lot of people were worried that the country would be able to survive at all? Well, some different European countries saw these weaknesses and and started to you know, take advantage of these weaknesses. Uh, Great Britain ignored the Treaty of Paris and refused to take its troops out of the Ohio Valley. Uh, Spain closed up its port in New Orleans to American shipping. And uh, so something had to change, and it had to change fast. Otherwise, this very young nation would soon become not a nation. But despite its differences in almost every other area, Congress was able to pass the Land Ordinance of 1785, which governed the Northwest Territory, and we're looking here at a picture of the Northwest Territory. It's present-day Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, and parts of Illinois, Minnesota. And so it allowed for the governing of this area and allowed for the area to be divided up into future states. And in 1787, Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance, which officially set up a government for the Northwest Territory. And the Northwest Ordinance guaranteed basic rights to settlers, outlawed slavery, and provided for that area to be further divided up into, into states. So the Land Ordinance of 1785, which ultimately became the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. So, when America won the Revolution, it also won all the British lands south of Canada and east of the Mississippi. The new United States now had to decide what to do with this land. At first, the states were given control, but that didn't work. So a new plan was developed. The plan was called the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Under the Northwest Ordinance, once the population of an area totaled 5,000 free males who owned at least 50 acres of land, the people could elect an assembly and establish their own government. When the territory had 60,000 people, it could apply to become a new state. From all this territory came the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. A part of Minnesota was also in the territory. Kentucky was originally a western county of Virginia. It became a separate state in 1792. In 1796, Tennessee became the 16th state. The last two states in the original territory of the United States, Mississippi and Alabama, joined the Union in 1817 and 1819. So what did the Northwest Ordinance really do? It the big thing about it was that it provided for a way for new states to be admitted into the Union, and this is how the states could do that. Once a territory hit 60,000 free settlers, it could ask Congress to become a state and would be equal to those 13 original states in every single way. And really, the Northwest Ordinance was the best thing that the federal government was able to accomplish under the Articles of Confederation. but the country still could not pay back its debts, and after the revolution, the country went into an economic depression. If the Confederation experiences modest success in dealing with Western expansion, it clearly fails to deal with the nation's mounting debts. There's tremendous economic disruption uh, after the war. Obviously, England had been the major trading partner of the American colonies. A lot of people are holding currency, which is valueless, and also questions about how to re-establish the economic system and, and how to get things going. The hero, really, under the Articles of Confederation is Robert Morris, the Secretary of Finances. And he, all along, struggled against what he thought was best, that is a strong centralized government, and the realities that the states were not going to meet the requisitions. 
To preserve the financial integrity of the new nation, Morris lobbies for a 5% duty on imported goods. And it was an attempt to create a somewhat uh, more powerful federal government in which there would continue to be this balance between state sovereignty and national sovereignty, but that significant powers would move out of the states and would move into this federal government. And the problem with that strategy was that it could never overcome the, uh, the basic hurdle of uh, the requirement under the Articles of Confederation that all amendments had to be approved uh, by a unanimous vote of uh, the 13 state legislatures. So unanimity proved a real tough hurdle. Without a national solution, the debt problem remains with the states. All they can do is raise taxes. The farmers in western Massachusetts revolt. Shea's Rebellion was prompted by uh, a combination of desperate economic circumstances and a sense of, of the little people being crowded out by larger economic and political interests. And so many people, for lack of a better term, we might call them more kind of conservative or concerned for law and order <laughs> types, looked at Shea's Rebellion and said, this republic business is already complicated. This is exactly the kind of thing that we were worried about. This is the too much participation, too much democracy, which was a negative word in the 1780s and 90s. Democracy was next door to mob action, and that's what many people saw as the message of Shea's Rebellion. Washington, when he was informed of Shea's Rebellion, said, Perhaps we have had too favorable a view of human nature in forming our government. So this gave justification and impetus to moving toward a government that would have more protections for the property classes, for law and order and stability, as opposed to worrying quite so much about you know, protecting against the encroachments of power in a central government. The group that was most significantly hit by this economic depression uh, were, was a group of farmers. During the war, a lot of farmers had borrowed money from the government for farm equipment, but as prices dropped after the war, the farmers couldn't pay back their debts. And in Massachusetts specifically, taxes were raised, and if a farmer couldn't pay back his debts, the government would seize his farm. And in response to this, a man named Daniel, Shea, Daniel Shays, who had been a, a former Minuteman, mind you, organized a revolt in 1786 known as Shays' Rebellion. And in this rebellion, those involved attacked courthouses to prevent the state from taking more farms. And eventually this revolt was put down by the Massachusetts militia. But the impact of Shays' Rebellion is that it was a wake-up call for many Americans. And it was a sign that the Articles of Confederation were not working. Something had to change, and in May of 1787, leaders from several states met in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. Again, I repeat, they met in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. But what resulted was a completely new U.S. Constitution. Well, there's a lot of discontent in America uh, producing things like Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts. So ordinary people, when they do talk about where we're going to go, they really seem upbeat. This is going to be just a great country. Look at all the resources we've got that nobody else has. If we can't preserve this union, this is not going to be the heaven on earth that you think it is. If we split up into rival confederations, well, then each one will want to get the advantage of Western resources for itself, and they may start arming against one another. If we stay united, we might keep European power out of most of North America in any very active way. If we divide, we become just part of their balance of power, uh, and the cost to us will be really enormous. And uh, the major argument for constitutional reform then became we need to unite so that the other powers of the world will take us seriously. If we don't, those very same powers are going to take advantage of our divisions 
and this will be the opening wedge for Count Their Revolution. For these people, the stakes were very, very high. Uh, this wasn't just about, will the House of Representatives go back to the Democrats, this November question that might seem very important to us now. It was about whether there would be a, a free house as opposed to a monarch or a dictator coming in. Uh, would there be secret uh, conspiracies to overthrow the legitimate power because this, I mean, they lived in a world in which these were not un, untoward, ungrounded fears. It became increasingly clear that the Articles of Confederation had to go, they had to be replaced by something else. However, there was so much nervousness about even bringing this up for debate that people agreed that they would not institute a new government, but they would only modify the Articles of Confederation. For most of the 1780s, the, the basic agenda of reform for men like Madison, John Dickinson, Robert Morris, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, had been to try to put together some kind of strategy that would enable the Articles of Confederation to be ratified in a kind of piecemeal way. And I think the basic idea was to try to get one amendment adopted and then another and then to demonstrate that you could actually strengthen the national government without creating a tyranny on the other hand. Having seen what they thought was a tyrannical government, they were most concerned to erect all kinds of hedges against tyranny. They didn't want a strong central government. And so finally that leads in 1786 to the expedient of calling the Annapolis Convention, you know, really as an independent body, not quite tainted the way the kind of Congress was being tainted in terms of public perceptions in the 1780s. And the uh, problem with Annapolis was that uh, although eight states had appointed uh, commissioners to go there, only about a dozen guys from five states show up, so they don't really have enough of a quorum to do anything. But they didn't want to adjourn empty-handed, so they proposed a general convention to meet the following May. It was a good thing that Annapolis didn't succeed, because then that allowed these energetic, visionary nationalists to take the next step. Uh, because the, the argument was always that if the Union fails, then anarchy is the next result. And so every successive failure in efforts to uh, amend the Articles uh, also led to this uh, escalating concern about the future of the Union and of the Revolution. In the months immediately leading up to Philadelphia in, in May 1787, is the recognition that the time has come not only to save Congress from the states, not only to enable the national government to act independently of the states, not to be dependent upon their compliance with all its recommendations and requisitions and resolutions and proposals and the like, but also to save the states from themselves. As delegates to the Constitutional Convention begin their journey to Philadelphia in the spring of 1787, some may recognize that the Articles of Confederation did play a significant role in the early days of the Republic. Under the Articles of Confederation, we survived as a nation. We were not invaded by our former enemies. We learned what it was to create a government. We learned that the states were going to have to work with each other, that they didn't have the war to unite them anymore so that they had to find other ways to do it and they got a lot of practice in in governing so i think the articles of confederation served a very useful purpose and were an excellent transition to the constitution got people thinking about what it is to form a government so when they met first in annapolis and then in philadelphia they could get down to the serious work of framing a constitution. Which brings us to the assignment for today. Now, I want you to uh, imagine that you are a farmer living in 1787, and you've been having trouble paying back your loans, and have recently heard about the uprising in Massachusetts under Daniel Shays. And You've heard about this uprising and you're afraid that more rebellions could mean that the country you fought to help create would soon be destroyed. So I want you to choose one of the problems facing the new nation. It could be Britain not paying back the war, uh, states printing their own money, rebellions, a lack of cooperation between the states. Um, choose one of those problems and write a letter to 
your delegate of the Constitutional Convention. Remember, they met in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. So I want you to take that problem, explain what the problem is, and then offer a possible solution. Now, your letter should be short because remember you're a farmer and you don't have access to a lot of paper so one to two paragraphs should be enough two mainly one to explain the problem and one to offer a solution because what point is bringing up a problem a problem without a solution that's a complaint a problem with a solution that's a possibility so make sure that you describe the problem and a viable solution but be sure to use correct grammar and spelling because yet you are writing to a delegate so you want to be heard so keep all that in mind as you're writing your letter today and if you have any questions please come and find me otherwise have a wonderful rest of your day and thanks for hanging out as we talked about the articles of confederation